You're listening to the Creative Capital Podcast. You're dying to learn about how you can create wealth through real estate investing? Then you've come to the right place. Join in every week as we go over the ins and outs of real estate investing and learn how you too can become financially free. That's why it's a good thing to get accredited investors, Josh. Tell you the truth. Accredited investors, they know what they're getting into because they've usually done a deal or so or two or 20 in the past. So they know what to expect out of investing in real estate. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Ferrari, host of the Creative Capital Podcast. And we've got today with us, Mr. Charles Wessel. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Charles, but he is doing phenomenal over there in the Charleston, South Carolina market absolutely hilarious dude <laughs> more than anything he's successful he knows what he's talking about he's got his head on his shoulders he talks a lot about how he has ADD but he's just a funny guy he's a cool guy he just loves loves to have fun but also loves to be successful in business and so I think you guys will learn a lot from kind of the perspective that he gives on some of the things we talk about today specifically about creating successful partnerships how he's gone about doing that how he's found these partners what that looks like how, you know, just all of the details of, of partnerships, how you even decide if someone would be a good partner. How do you find a good partner? How do you determine roles and responsibility? Just all the lingering questions that you would ever have around potentially creating a long lasting partnership with someone in business. He, uh, he does a great job at answering them today. And I am just ecstatic for you guys to jump in and listen to what he has to say. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into the show. Charles Wessel, my man, welcome out to the Creative Capital Podcast. Great to have you here, man. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate the uh, appreciate the invitation to be on the show, Josh. <laughs> yeah. We had a great conversation, what, a week, two weeks ago? We did. And I just kind of wanted to take that, dive deeper into some of the things we talked about, maybe even extrapolate some some deeper things, and really talk about creating successful partnerships, which we talked about the, how you've done uh, phenomenally and how you've continued to do as you've continued to kind of grow deeper into the business that, you, that you're that running now, the, the real estate kind of multifamily business. So for those out there that have no idea who Charles Wessel is or where you might live with that twang Southern accent you got. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you started in, in real estate. Yeah. Well, Charlie Wessel's from, uh, from Charleston, South Carolina, and I'll stop using the third person referrals here right now. Yeah. We live in Charleston, South Carolina, me and my wife of 20 years, uh, I have 11 year old son and twin seven year old girls and life is good in Charleston, man. You know, as long as you got a boat and live close to the water, you're doing all right. We're actually kind of a funny story. We're actually going uh flounder gigging right as soon as this is over tonight. So me, me and the boy are going flounder gigging, but yeah, yeah. I have Cordell capital and we raise, we raise capital for, uh, multifamily deals, as well as some um, mobile home park deals here in the, mainly here in the Carolinas. We do, well, we have one in Georgia as well. And uh, one in, we have one in Green, Greensboro, North Carolina, and one in Columbia, South Carolina. So walk us through kind of what, where the interest came from, like the, the, the desire, I guess, to yeah. get into real estate. You know, what did you do before? Are you still doing that? And then what does that kind of look like? Right, right. Well, I owned a general contracting firm for 10 years. And I, at the time, yeah, I sold that four years ago because I just, I had little kids. I was working, I mean, Monday through Saturday and sometimes on Sunday. And it just was a mess. We had, a, it was a pretty successful company. Um, I ended up selling that four years ago to do this. I did, you know, I talked to several buddies of mine that were real estate brokers, commercial brokers. That was really who I worked for in the general contracting space. We built out commercial office spaces and commercial buildings for 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 their clients. 
So I, you know, I passed by this huge office building one day. We had, we had several uh, rental houses and we, we had a, uh, you know, that was just a, a pain in the butt, but we passed by a big, nice office building sitting on the Ashley river down here in Charleston and had my buddy's name all over it. So I called him up and he basically, he said, come on down here, man, let's talk about this. Cause I told him, I said, how do I buy a building like that? And he said, come on down to my office. We'll talk about it. And uh, so I did. And the building was like $20 million. I'm so far from having $20 million. It's just, you know, not even funny, but I knew that somehow people own these buildings and it's not just all super uber wealthy people. And he told me, he said, you know, sitting there in his office, he said, look, man, you can buy commercial real estate and it'll make you extremely wealthy. He said, I, I, I invest money for wealthy people every day and buying buildings. He said, but the best and safest asset class out there is going to be B and C class apartment complex. He said, it's going to just cash flow like crazy. He said, everybody needs a house. And he said, I don't even sell that. So I can't even sell it to you. I, I'm just telling you, when you get these deals, let me know because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest with you. <laughs> so, he, you know, and he's a good friend of mine to this day. Yeah, he's a great guy. And so that's how I got started. And then I just, I went home that night and dove into it and ended up getting somebody's course. Uh, I think it was Michael Blanc's course. And it was very, you know, very informational. And I just rabbit hold it for, from there for almost a year before we took action. Because I knew that if I'm using my buddy's money to go buy real estate, I've got to know everything there is to know about this. And I could lose my money. I can't lose my buddy's money because they start getting pissed when you lose their money. Trust me, I take their money on the golf course all the time. So... That's really, I mean, you know, that's it. I mean, that's how we got started. And I just started going to conferences and everything else and met up with some really good people that were buying deals and that had a lot of deals and they were doing really well. And uh, so I partnered up with them and started raising capital for them and, and was part of the, G, the, the general partnership. And I would go to the properties and do some due diligence. And so that way I was really a part of the GP on those teams. I love how you just took action. Like, firstly, I love how simple the story is. And maybe there was a little bit more complexity there. But in in actuality, it was just you saw this office building, thought it was cool. Your buddy's name was on it. And you're like, I'm just going to go talk to a friend, go hang out, see what he knows about yeah. real estate. And maybe I'll learn something. Maybe I won't. I don't know. If anything, I get to hang out. And then he tells you something really cool. So you go home, try to learn more about it, get a course. And then dive like head first in for a year yeah. before going even deeper and starting to eventually do deals. I, I just love the fact that you took action, that you didn't just, he told you about it and you're like, well, that's really cool, but I'll never do anything like that. I'm just going to go gigging or I'm just going to go fishing with <laughs> playing golf, whatever it was that, you know, most people do or go work a different W2 instead of really doing what you, you find true passion for them, which you actually enjoy and what will actually create the lifestyle that you want to live. So love that you took action there. So I wanted to ask now from that, I think a lot of people really struggle, even if they do take action, even if they buy the course and they start networking with folks and learning everything that they can, I think it's a big struggle for a lot of people to do their first deal, especially in multifamily. You know, the barrier to entry is significantly higher. And even now with COVID and whatever's going on with the economy right now, the level of competition in multifamily is ridiculous. And so I think it's probably even harder or a higher barrier of entry to get into the multifamily space now. So how did you finally do that first deal? Walk us through what that kind of looked like all the way from kind of meeting the partners to analyzing it and kind of give us some background on that. Well, I, like I said, that all happened in, I, it's crazy because I remember like it was yesterday, it happened in November of 2016. So I finally went to that first conference. I, I dove in that night and stayed up till like three o'clock in the morning, come back from that meeting with that guy, you know, in this course. And I just knocked it all out in a few days. But I had to, you know, the next conference that he was having was in like, I don't even know, like January or February of 2017. So I went to that 
and uh, just met a bunch of people. I mean, I'm pretty good at talking. Uh, yeah, I can talk to a lot. Yeah, I can talk to damn near anybody. So after that, you know, I, I met a bunch of people there. And that's when I really dove into really, you know, reading books and learning everything else I could and, you know, looked up several other people that had courses and, and it just, you know, I was just really hungry for the knowledge of it. So it took me another year and a half before I even got into another deal, before I even got into my first deal. Because I was so, I had the analysis paralysis for sure, because I just had to make sure that the money was safe. I've lost money before in the stock market, a lot of money. And I did not want to do that again. So yeah, I, I, you know, I went to several different conferences during that time where I kept meeting the same people. I mean, the same people are at these conferences. So that's when I started making some pretty good, you know, long relationships with some people. And uh, that's when, you know, they called me up and said, Hey, do you want to help us out with this deal that we have down in Georgia? It's up. 152 units in Georgia. And uh, I mean, I looked at the underwriting on it and I'm pretty good at killing a deal in underwriting. I don't like to sit there and plug everything in. That's not me. I, I'm going to go out and raise the money for it. Y- y'all find the deal. I- I'll help. I'll help with the, you know, the money aspect of it. That's what I like doing is, but so, you know, I, I looked at their underwriting. I couldn't kill the deal. It was a great deal. So I ran out, went out and, you know, reached out to several buddies and we raised a little bit of money and went in with them and it just worked out. And then the next, the next one came, I don't even know, like almost a year later, just because deals are so hard to find, you know, we're underwriting deals. We're extremely conservative. We want to make sure that we're returning good capital back to our investors. So anyway, it took a whole nother year to get into another one, but it was with the same group, great group, great group of people. I mean, they have over like 12 properties right now and they're doing really well at at all of them and then the next one we closed was about eight months after that one we closed the one in greensboro i closed out with some other buddies here in charleston i love your metaphor of of killing the deal like i i like to kill deals this one couldn't be killed so i felt like it made sense i felt like i shot it a million times just kept missing (laughs) <laughs> and it it withstood the test of time and the test of me going after it. Yeah. I think that a lot of people do think pie in the sky when they get first started and analyzing deals and they really want something to make sense. And especially now with how competitive everything is, you know, they offer over asking and they're like, the deal's still amazing. It's still great. Like, is it really? Did you really do the right underwriting? Did you really look at all the variables? and the different exit strategies and what lending is going to end up costing and everything else. So I like that you mentioned that and that you put a focus on that before you actually started raising money, before you actually started closing deals. I think that's really important. And before I even kind of move on here, I wanted to ask you, where did you meet these people that you're raising money for? You know, had you ever raised money before this or did you just have this big array of rich friends that, that wanted in on, on these deals. What did that look like for you? Well, I mean, we have always grown up on the golf course. So, you know, we didn't grow up hunting or fishing. My daddy grew up and put golf clubs in our hands. So we've always been a member of the golf course. I mean, I didn't even take up hunting and fishing until I was probably 30 years old. And then I jumped in a rabbit hole on that as well. I got more hobbies than I should. And my wife will attest to that. But it, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you hang out at the golf course long enough. There's a few boys around here that's got some money. They got some drop powder sitting around. So you get to talking about it long enough, and they're they, uh, they're finally like, dude, just shut up. Here, here's 50 grand, you know. Go, let's go make some money, dude. You know, you've been telling me about this real estate investing thing forever. And, uh, yeah, I hadn't seen the first deal yet, so. <laughs> So it's just like cre- creating friends, talking to people, creating relationships, not even diving deep into going to talk to someone specifically about needing to raise money. It's like, hey, let's just be bros. Let's just chill, hang out, talk life. Yeah. Shoot the crap. Like, I just want to hang out. And then maybe there's some byproduct here where we do business together and everyone makes money. I don't know, but I really just want to hang out. That's kind of the intent there. That's that's the intent. I'm not going to put it that way to my wife, but yes, that's the intent. 
I love that because that's what I, I like to preach on a lot because I think a lot of people think that there is this deep need to sell themselves when they're trying to talk to someone about money or investing in real estate or coming to partner with them on something or how they can make them so much money. And I had that initial idea or, or thought when I first got started in the space, like that's the only way I'm going to be able to raise money. I did not grow up on golf courses or in any kind of country, rich clubs, like I just grew up broke. So I don't know anyone with money. How the heck am I going to raise money? So that was my initial thought, but I like that it's literally just as simple as going out and creating relationships. And I hear so many people that do that and find success through that. So I think that is a, a massive point there. And so I think you already touched a little bit on how to find these partners. You said you started going to some of these meetups. You started going to these conferences. And were you a part of any like local meetups or masterminds? Or what did that look like for you? I am. Yes, I am part of a uh, local meetup here. It meets like the first and third Fridays at seven o'clock in the morning, downtown Charleston at a little cafe. I mean, the guy that, that puts it on is just, I mean, they're, they're rock stars in the space. I mean, I think they have like over like $700 million in assets and management now. I don't know if I'm supposed to say people's names on here or not, but I, I mean, it's Danny Randazzo with the passive investing.com group. Yeah. Super sharp guy. And he just is so willing to help, to help teach anybody. He really is. I mean, and he's just full of knowledge. You know, he, he's been investing in, in commercial real estate for long before, you know, we thought it was cool. So, you know, yeah. I mean, this is how the wealthy have been investing Josh for eons. I mean, I believe since, since the, it. yeah. Since the, you know, dawn of the age, man, this is how wealthy people have been investing. Uh. And we've been taught to go start a 401k and put it in here and it'll grow, you know, six, maybe 8% a year. And then the guy managing it, he's going to take two or three off of that. And then, you know, kind of left with this. And by the time you're 70 years old, you'll have a million bucks in the bank. A million dollars now is hardly any at this point. No, I know it. I know it. Well, for somebody who's making, you know, 60 grand a year their whole life or something like that, man. I mean, you know, that'll take them to where they kick the bucket and can leave a couple grand to their kids. I'd rather not do that, man. You know, I'm trying to create like generational wealth here, like a, yeah. you know, a family legacy that my kids can either step into or not step into, you know, I mean, they can come and do commercial real estate with dad or, you know, they can cook in a restaurant downtown. I don't care what they do, but. You know, they, the option is there. Right. The option. When they hang out with me, they're going to have fun. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to make business fun. Exactly. Yeah, Making money yeah, business. Exactly. yeah. So I wanted to dive back into the partnership aspect of it all, where you've now found these potential partners, you've found and networked with a lot of these people. And I wanted to ask, how do you decide whether or not someone is a good is a good partner? Is there a good fit? You know, what are some of the criteria that you kind of use to be like, okay, I can see myself doing business with this person for the next like 10 years or 20 years or 30. Years. Like that's a long, it's like a marriage. It's like a long committed relationship there. How do you make that decision? It is. It is. I mean, we have got to have some values that line up. You know, we got to be able to see, you know, I, I, trust me, man, there's people that have wanted to invest with us before that, I, like you said, I'm not getting in, in a marriage with these people, man. I'm, I'm not going to be tied to these people for the next five or 10 years. It's not going to happen. But I mean, for the most part, most people are, you know, they're good people and they don't, you know, I mean, that's why it's a good thing to get accredited investors, Josh, tell you the truth. Accredited investors, they know what they're getting into because they've usually done a deal or so or two or 20 in the past. So they know what to expect out of investing in real estate. But I mean, I've even had partners that we've raised money with that are here in the space. You know, my good buddy Blake and, and Jake Bolin and those guys. I mean, we raised capital for another deal. And I mean, these guys here, we formed a, a partnership together. But I mean, I you know, I've hung out with these guys before. I mean, these guys are great guys, man, that I've known. And, uh, you know, I, I want to do life with guys like this. 
Yeah, I do. I, I want to, I mean, I'm going to be, I, you know, all of us, we kind of joke around and be like, dude, we're, you know, we're kind of stuck together for like the next at least 30 years, man. Like we're going to be doing this forever. You know, I mean, cause even when we don't, you know, even if we do have, you know, even if you got a billion dollars in assets, I mean, the guy today on a webinar today, he's got over a billion dollars in assets and he's looking at how he can grow his company. And somebody was like, well, aren't you ready to, you know, it's like sell it and retire. And he, he was like, no, nah, man, I'm just, you know, we're, we're putting systems and processes in place. That way I don't have to necessarily do everything. He said, but I'll always be there. You know, he said, it's what, what I do, man. It's fun. You know, it's fun. Yeah. It's, you're never actually working a day because it's actually something that you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. We're hanging <laughs> out with other real estate investors and we're killing it. You know, we're crushing it and it's, it's good. Life's good, man. I kind of like that philosophy. You're just looking for cool people. You're know, like, it's people you want to do life with for the next decade or a couple of decades. Not, not even necessarily like, Hey, do we have complimentary skill sets? Do we, do we have this? Do we have, you're like, nah, are you cool? Are we, do we have like the same direction? Are we trying to at least go the same direction? All right. You're fine. You're fine with me. Let, let's work together. Is, is yeah. that kind of hitting the head on the, or the nail on the head? Is that it? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, man, if we can go out and play around the golf and drink some beer and, you know, Toss a few bucks around per hole, man. Well, you know, I can definitely get along with this guy. So I, I actually had to ask, and this is completely off topic, but I know absolutely nothing about golf. I mean, the negatives and the positive points make no sense to me. So what is, and maybe this is a cliche question, I don't know, but what is the secret to being good at golf? What is that sauce there? I mean, it's practice and giving zero craps. I'll say crap. <laughs> zero crap? Yeah. Why is that? You can't, you can't go out there and, and, you know, just stress over it. I mean, I play golf with guys that go out there and they get all upset over a, a golf shot. I'm like, look, man, you're on a golf course. I'm going get upset out here. It's beautiful. It's, you know. It's so, beautiful. okay, let me ask you this. What is the most beautiful golf course you ever played on? Oh man, I played some nice courses. You, you know where the uh, PGA Championship was just now down at uh, Kiowa. I played the Ocean Course a couple times where they just had that tournament at. Man, I played. I played some really pretty golf courses. I mean, you got Preston Wood in Cary, North Carolina. The uh, I mean, I live five doors down from the clubhouse here at Stono Ferry, the links at Stono Ferry out here in Charleston. It's a beautiful golf course. I love it. I mean, it runs along the uh, Stono River. And, you know, we got a, a Revolutionary War bunker out in the middle of one of the fairways out here. I mean, it's like original, old school. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Back, back on topic now. The, the, the next thing I really wanted to ask was, what is the, or what was the process like for you in creating that first partnership? Other than just like, hey, you're cool. Let's, let's do business together. You know, how do you really determine roles and responsibilities and then not only that, but now you've determined roles and responsibilities. You've gotten in the partnership and everyone's high on ecstasy. I don't know. Everyone's high on life, ready to get started and jump in this business and make some money. How do you then keep these folks accountable all along the way to stay at 100% at what they were designated to do? I mean, yeah, besides having fun with the partners, they got to have a damn head on their shoulders. You know what I mean? So whoever I partner up with, it's got to be pretty, you know, pretty sharp. I mean, all that is real. you know, the roles and stuff are really spelled out in the beginning. And we put it down on paper and everybody agrees to it. As far as, you know, making sure everybody stays accountable. I mean, we have monthly meetings every month on every property that we have. And usually when we first get into a property, I mean, we have weekly meetings and especially in the, the beginning of it. I mean, we'll have weekly meetings to see, you know, to check KPIs or key performance indicators, what everybody's doing. You know, I mean, it's, you got to have stuff like that or else somebody will get, you know, sidetracked, especially, I mean, you know, I, I'm not saying you have to have this to be successful, but I think 98% of the most successful people out there are ADD. God knows I am. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's how we juggle all this stuff, man. 
it's just being like going one thing to the next. Uh, that's how, that's how you juggle yeah. yeah. You know, you got to hop from property to property and, you know, investor to investor. And it's, it's, it's fun. Like I said, man, it's fun. Now, what advice would you give to someone who has never, I guess, done a deal before or created a partnership before they really know that they need one. Cause they know, they're not going to be able to do this alone. I don't think anyone can really do I mean, And maybe you can, I don't know, maybe you're a, self-made billionaire and you can go buy apartments all by yourself, but it's more fun to do it with people. It makes more sense. It makes life easier. They're just, I feel like there's way too many pros and cons in partnering with folks. But anyhow, as, as we know, as we're talking about this, what advice would you give to someone that has never created a partnership before? How do they go about approaching that conversation with someone that they think would make a great partner, someone that they think is cool, someone they've known for a long time, someone they met at a conference that they think is killing it and they like the same markets and there's just all the the symmetry there. How do you go about approaching that? Well, the first thing you've got to do in this business, as well as you should do in any business, is get a mentor. You have to get a mentor. And if your mentor is free, it's probably not going to be a really good mentor. But I mean, we pay a lot of money for mentors here in this in this space. I mean, I, you know, I wrote a five digit check to my mentor this year, but that gets you started on the right path. I mean, you know, it, can you get into this business without any money? You can. It's difficult. You, you got to have a little bit of powder to come in and, and really kind of, you know, be you know successful out the gate. But, it, you know, you it can you can take your time and, and build all that stuff up as well. But I mean, in order to find a, a partner, you got to find a mentor first. And if that mentor, you know, is not going to necessarily partner up with you, then somebody else that they mentor, they'll introduce you to them and say, Hey, look, man, you guys should work together, you know, and going to all these events. I mean, yeah, it, this, this is a, it is very much a team sport, man. I mean, I, you know, like I, like you just said, unless you're just independently wealthy and smarter than all get out, then yeah, go underwrite your own deals and, and pay for them. But the majority of us don't have that luxury. So we have to go and partner up with people. I mean, dude, it, this is very much a team sport from everybody from, you know, the accountant you pick to sponsors, to key principals, guys that'll sign on the line to, you know, the, the lawyer. Oh my God. I mean, it's the most important part of the deal, man. You got to make sure he's got all his paperwork right. You know, I mean, it's, you got to really have a lot of faith in your lawyer and, and a lot of, you know, the, the partnerships that you build in this business are going to come from relationships that you build from getting out there and going to meetups and going to these conferences and stuff like that. I love that. Yeah. Now you brought up a good topic. You brought up the topic of mentors. And so I wanted to ask, how does one determine whether or not a mentor is, I guess I'll use the word reputable. You know, how do you determine you're not about to give 20,000, 50,000, hundred thousand dollars to this dude. That's a guru that isn't going to teach you a dang thing. And you just lost a bunch of money that you could have otherwise been successful with. How do you really make that determination, you know, you know quickly, so to say? Yeah, I hate to keep spinning it back to this, man, but that comes from the meetups and the conferences. It really does. Because people will tell you real quick if, you know, oh, man, I, you know, I gave this guy 6000 bucks, and it just, yeah, he taught me something. I mean, you're going to get something out of any of them. Even the gurus that have done, you know, three deals, and now they know how to do everything. So if, if you get, you know, one of those guys, you know, you're still going to learn a lot from them. I just don't know how much they're going to really grab you by the collar and kind of bring you along and keep you accountable and stuff like that. You know, they're, they're just in it more for the educational part to just throw you, you know, a bunch of webinars and be like, here, take these and you'll know everything. And what's really funny is when they give you their, their document library that has a PPM in it, <laughs> like, I, I don't know, that should be the first warning sign there. If, if somebody tries to send you like a boilerplate PPM, just go somewhere else, man. Cause that's gotta be done by a lawyer. It's got, I mean, each deal is, you know, totally different and it's, it's gotta totally be done by a uh, SEC lawyer. 
So you've had experiences then with, with some of these gurus. Uh, yeah, yeah. Here's a subscription doc. You just send this to your lawyer and they can just add a couple of things and pay them $500. I mean, the lawyer's going to laugh as soon as you send that to them and tear it up and throw it in the trash. Because <laughs> it's different for every deal. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like a thumbprint on every deal. You know, that's totally different. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it does go back to connections. It goes back to referrals. And I guess just there is no quick and easy determination of whether or not someone is reputable. You got to seriously do the vetting for yourself before you spend this kind of money. Really do. And the vetting doesn't just come from looking at their website or seeing all the cool stuff they're going to provide. It comes with talking to maybe some, some of the people that have gone through their course before yeah. or someone that maybe hasn't gone through the course, but knows a lot about them, knows a lot about how they do business. Maybe they've just invested with them before, but hasn't gone through the course. And they're like, yeah, they, they're horrible. They're like the worst manager, asset managers ever. Like, obviously they're not going to teach you anything good because I think they suck and I'm on the investing side. So yeah, that would be like a red flag. So I think you're right. Just, just talking to folks and seeing what the, uh, what, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Checking the temp of the water. I don't Checking know. The, I don't know. That, that works. I tell you what, man, you really should talk, you know, in finding a mentor, talk to people who have, have been their mentor that they have done two or more deals after they were in the mentorship or even during and see how it went. You know what I mean? That, that's a good, that's, that'd be a good one. I like that. All right. So I, I know that with everything going on now, we've talked briefly about how difficult and competitive that the market truly is. So would you say, and your personal opinion or your professional opinion that, or, or the question is more so, is it possible for someone that's never invested in a, in a multifamily deal before on the GP side, never been active, they've never partnered with someone before, is it still possible for people to create these partnerships and close deals that are brand new in this market? For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you got to find that needle. That needle in the haystack out there. I mean, people are buying deals every day. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what their underwriting is like, but people are buying deals every day. So, I mean, you know, we just we just put together a nice a nice offer. Right now, it's five hundred six B. So, I, you know, it's still not even out there right now. So, I can't really talk about it, but it'll be out there sh shortly here with the next few days. But it it's a uh, you know, so there are still deals out there be done it's just you just got to underwrite so many of them to get in to get in there and i mean people are even i heard about a guy finding a deal uh not long ago and i know him so i know if he got this deal off of loot net i mean that's where deals go to die but it, he pulled up he got word off of this deal that was on loot net and he underwrote it and he bought the deal and it's doing great so they're out there it's creative strategy right now. It's hard, it's it's hard to get one out there right now, but they're out there and we're in no big hurry. Josh, you in a big hurry? I ain't in no big hurry, man. Like I said, I'll be doing this for the next 20 years. And I guarantee you, we will have hundreds of million dollars worth of property. So, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I'd like to do, you know, three to five a year. That would be nice. But if I do two, I'm okay with that. You know, I, yeah. it's not because we didn't put in the work looking for them. I can tell you that. Right. As long as they're like slam dunk deals, you know, it's, it's, it's all right. I'd rather do a slam, two slam dunk deals than five mediocre deals that I got to oh, work twice. Yeah. I got to be able to go to bed at night knowing that I just got $3 million worth of buddy's money in these deals. So, you know, <laughs> it's got to be a damn good deal before we go to get them. But yeah. That is definitely true. All right. Last question before we kind of transition into the next segment of the show. Yes, and I have to ask, when it comes to truly being successful in this business, how impactful do you think have your partnerships been? I mean, without them, I wouldn't have a deal. It's pretty pertinent. Yeah, it's 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 very important. I mean, partnerships, That's like true. I said, man, it's a team sport. You know, you all got to go out and kill this animal and drag it, drag it home. So it's it's a team sport. For sure. Love it. Love it. It is a team sport. And I'm glad that we have beaten that dead horse <laughs> to the point of, of people knowing that it is and that it is still yeah. possible to do deals and, and everything else we've talked about. Okay, Charles, jumping now into the next segment of the show called the Pod Deck segment. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of this company, 
pod decks, but they create these decks of cards. They got thousands of them at this point. And what we're going to do here today is I'm going to pull out this deck here and I'm going to sift through them. You are going to tell me when to stop. We're going to pick two. And whatever the heck question is on the back of these cards, that's the question I'm going to ask you, and you got to answer it. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm as ready as I'm going to be. All right. Tell me when to stop. There you go. Stop. Was, was that stop? <laughs> All right. Stop. There we go. You sweating in your seat? <laughs> okay. First question, and this is more like a like a statement than a question, but I like this one. Let's, let's, let's see what new things we can find out about you today. Yeah. Tell us four things that we might not know about you. I am a thrill seeker. I have like dirt bikes. I have a side-by-side. We have a four-wheeler. Me and my kids, we go to Carolina Adventure World and just get all crazy on motorsports. I love that. Yeah. I absolutely love, I've, I've always wanted, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've wanted a four-wheeler. My dad always said we couldn't get one because we had nowhere to drive it. That was his excuse. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, please, you just think it's too dangerous or something. Yeah. All right, well, that was one. I got three more to go. All right, three more. All right, yeah. I collect watches. Really? Um, I smoked for 20 years and don't smoke anymore. <laughs> Congrats. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It. I know. It. Yeah. That's three. Let's go with four. I had, uh, I had to have plastic surgery on my hand 13 weeks ago. And here for all the people that are viewing this, that's what that looks like. I busted three of my fingers and it was actually on the side by side that we rolled over. One of my employees rolled it over. So, man, yeah. What is so? What? What is plastic surgery like on a hand? Well, there was bones hanging out of these two fingers here, and so they huh. kind of put everything back together. So it's it's definitely messed up my golf game. I'm I'm plan on not playing again until 2022. So. Oh man! Because I just moved in next door to the dog on pro shop. You know, I'm like five doors down from the first tee. <laughs> oh, man. Well, cool. Four new things we now know about Mr. Charles. All right. Next question. What? This is a little less personal, I guess. This is more thought-provoking. Let's see. Let's see what you think. What will become outdated, dangerous, and removed from all homes 20 years from now? Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> That's going to be dangerous. <laughs> it is dangerous. Very dangerous. It's sure not going to be guns. Not in South Carolina anyway. You know, I, I mean, I don't even know. To me, I have an 11-year-old boy. So, to me, it would have to be, you know, game consoles because that's what this kid loves to do. I mean, he's great at sports. He's an awesome athlete. But, yeah, I drives me crazy when he goes upstairs to go play video games. You're used to going outside and hashing, playing in the sticks and playing in the mud and yeah. doing the motorsport thing. And yeah, let's go. Yeah, let's go hit golf balls. I mean, right here at the drive range, you know. And he's like, "No, nah, twiddle my thumbs." Yeah. <laughs> well, cool, man. All right, now we're gonna go and transition to the last thing of the show called the core four. Same four questions we ask every guest. First question: What is your favorite real estate related book? Okay, this is gonna be a book that. Uh, well, and Raising Capital for Real Estate by Hunter Thompson. I mean, he is, I'm in a mastermind with him now, Raise Masters, phenomenal mastermind. It's all about raising capital. It's all about structuring deals. It's just a really solid program. And um, he actually has a mentorship program as well. And I've been through other mentorships and been through his and his is one of the most legit ones out there. It really is, man. That they they really do keep you accountable. Um, but that's my favorite book, anyway. Real estate related book. Well, I love all the extra golden nuggets we got. I there. know. But like I said, man, ADD, man, makes <laughs> makes, makes the world go round. <laughs> yeah, I, I like Hunter Thompson's book. I actually had him on the show uh, just a couple months ago now, but the show episode released a couple of weeks ago. 
but yeah, great dude. Really knows the stuff. And I read his book right before I had him on and it's definitely, definitely a powerful book. He's got a lot of really kind of basic, but, but also high level things of, of, of what needs to happen. And then he dives deep into a lot of those in some of the chapters as well, which, which I also like for those that maybe, I don't know if ADD would pertain to the the depth or, or the detail, but I've always liked the the detail of things like, okay, yeah, you go, you talk to people, you raise money. How does that work? You know, give me the specifics. That's always been me. So I like that about that book. Yeah, anyway, he, does. he deep dives into it, you know, and that's, I like the specifics as well. I, I want to be, I want to know exactly what to do. I, you know, I need to be told exactly how to do this. And the book does that. It tells you exactly how to do all of it. It really does. It's great. Love it, man. All right. Next question. What do you think your unique skill is that helps you become successful? Running my mouth. <laughs> that that's a unique skill. Just just chatting, chatting away. It is. It is. Chatty Kathy. What what would be the male version of that? Chatty Tommy. Is that right? That is really right. Man, I guess I'm not quick enough for that, man. <laughs> All right, all right. Well, I'm Thanks. good at like you know, I'm good at putting the team together as well. You know, I'm good at putting the team together. I'm pretty good at leadership. And you know, I, you gotta have all that stuff no matter what aspect of business you're in. You have to have a team and you gotta, you know, be a good leader. And then you gotta have a good time. You gotta have a good time. I have a good time. <laughs> Love it, man. All right, next question. Tell me something that's true about real estate. And almost nobody agrees with you on. I don't think nobody agrees with me on this, but it's not it's not that nobody agrees with me on this, but it's less thought of these days because in the world of apartment syndications, you know, people are buying a A class asset at the same cap rate they can buy a C class value add. They don't have to do the work in it, you know, to bring the value add to it. But what also what they don't realize is that the cash flow is just going to be less. I mean, to me, the, you know, the cash on cash returns, the yearly, you know, cash returns that we return to our investors is very important to me. And it's nice to get a big fat check at the end of it when you sell it. I mean, you know, we, we call that the, the, the holy event, you know, the holy event, everybody gets a big, nice check. But, you know, I mean, we're doing this for mailbox money, Josh. So to me, I, you know, I still like the B and C class assets because I just think there's more room for more room for improvement, more room to increase NOI. Yeah, I mean, it's all about NOI. The whole game is about NOI. So that yeah. operating income. I like that you mentioned that because I, I can honestly say I don't think I've heard anyone specifically mention yeah, I'm going to go switch from B and C class to A class because I can buy the same property at the same cap rate and I have to do any of the work. I feel like so many podcasts out there now. That, oh, yeah, we're just really? going back to the A class because you know, it's the same cap rate. And you're like, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, in a value add, I mean, you almost create your own cap rate, you know, depending on how much value you add to the deal. Yeah how much new rents could be for and how much you can decrease expenses and all that beautiful stuff that makes people money yeah. for the eons ago, like you mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last question. What one piece of advice would you give try listeners wanting to succeed in real estate investing? I'm going to bring it back, man. Go find a mentor. Go find a mentor. It's the Ray Kroc theory, man. You're not reinventing the wheel. Wealthy people have been doing this forever. Somebody already knows how to do it, and somebody's already failed at it enough times to know what to do right and what to do wrong. You don't have to. You don't have to go through those headaches. Go get a mentor. They know how to coach you along, so that way you're not, you know, you don't have all these bumps on your noggin. And, you know, like I said earlier, man, I can lose my money. I can't lose my investor's money. Yeah, you got to educate yourself on the front end. Love it, man. Education is definitely massive in this space. If you don't know what you're doing, probably shouldn't be doing it because I think as the as the famous saying goes, you're going to pay for your education one way or the other, whether it's paying for it up front or absolutely failing on a deal and losing tons of <laughs> Very true statement, buddy. Very true statement. <laughs> All right, Charles, if anybody wants to learn more about you and your business, how can people get in touch? We're at 
CordellCapital.com, C-O-R-D-E-L-L, Capital.com. We're also, we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. We even have a Reddit group. We're on Reddit. So anyways, yeah, any of those those items, I mean, you can find it it's either under Cordell Capital or it'll be under Charles Wessel. I think you're going to get a mass influx of, of Reddit followers now. <laughs> you got I've never heard of anyone actually create a Reddit group inside of multifamily, but it's different. Maybe that'll be your secret to success. Who knows? Listen, you know, I was thinking about it. I was like, all right, so all these investors are going on Reddit to find out what the next hot stock is. You know, I mean, that's where GameStop and all that stuff went off was on Reddit. So that's I was crazy. Like, yeah, let's, let's, let's just go post some stuff on there about investing. And I have a virtual assistant and she posts stuff on there every day. Have you actually got any like leads and traction from that? Like investors or conversations? Uh, not or? from Reddit. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> we just started that like less than a month ago. I think. Okay. So it takes a while to get traction on social media, but it comes. It comes if you are persistent. Yeah. I actually listened to a podcast probably a month or two ago about a guy who raised like $10 million on TikTok. <laughs> I was like, what? Isn't that like a dancing, yeah. just weird, like teenage college app? But no, dude's raising a ton of money. I just was, you can raise money anywhere. You can almost be successful doing anything. It, yeah. It, it, when it comes to social media anyway, getting out there on social media and kind of branding yourself that way. I almost cut us off at the uh, at Instagram, but I got talked into it. So I guess there's a lot of people on Instagram. There are definitely a lot of people on Instagram. Well, cool, Charles. This has been fantastic. I feel like I learned a lot. I know that everyone else probably did too. And I got an in-depth insight now into, into your life. Everyone else did. Now they know that you're killing it, that you're crushing it. Hopefully they learned a lot from the partnership side of things, how to really create that. The fact that mentors are huge and so many other things. So thanks again for coming out on the show with us. Josh, thanks for having me, buddy. I appreciate it. What a fantastic show. Feel like we learned a ton. We learned four new things that most people probably don't know about, Charles. So I think right there, that's worth its its weight in gold. No, I'm just kidding. But but it, it doesn't he have such a unique perspective on how he's kind of delivering a lot of this information? I mean, it's a great perspective. I think it's a it's a positive, it's a comical, it's it's kind of a draw you in way about having these types of conversations about talking and creating relationships with people, mentors, finding mentors. I think that was huge. He talked about that a lot. Obviously that's made a huge impact in his life, which shows because he's only been in the space now for what, four years, five years. And he's already doing, he's already doing deals. He's already partnering with people. He's already raised millions of dollars at this point. He is obviously has a successful track record just from not only educating himself and going to a lot of these meetups, but I think that mentorship was massive for him. So I encourage you guys, if you're not already doing it, even if your city is shut down or COVID still got you all whacked out or whatever is going on in your life, I encourage you to still sign up for a virtual meetup if that's possible. A virtual meetup in your area or since it's virtual, it could be anywhere. Or if local meetups are going on, I encourage you to go to those. Create these relationships with these people. Not only is it educational, but you're able to network with folks. You're able to continue to expand your network and learn new things. They might have referrals and they might have, you might be introduced to their network. And it's kind of like this, this never ending cycle that allows you to continue to, to grow and and all in all, just be successful in what it is that you're trying to accomplish, because this is definitely a team sport. So guys, that's all I have for you today. Do not forget to leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes if you can. It helps tremendously with not only the show, but also with others being able to learn about these amazing new creative ways to preserve capital, grow their capital, and overall create generational wealth for themselves and their family. So. With that being said, this is Josh Ferrari signing off.